I did um, beg my partner to have sex with me. There's no other word for it because I wanted a baby. I almost wanted to replace what I'd lost, which is a really bad thing to think, but that's what it was. And I ended up having a beautiful little boy who um, kind of gave me a reason to live again. I almost felt like it was okay again. I would be okay. Um, but you don't ever really get over losing a child in that way. And I didn't even think, you know, it was the force that did it. I just felt like it was because I'm bad. Bad things will happen to me because I'm bad. It always happens to me because I deserve that. You tell yourself the same narrative. My children grew up. My daughter went to university and now we're living in this house and things are carrying on with the aggressive nature, the domestic violence, the domestic abuse. My head's being held underwater to tell me who's in control again. He said I deserved it and it's the only way I would listen to what he's saying. Everything was my fault. You know, I would sometimes lie to him because I would tell him what he wanted to hear. You know, were you looking at that sales rep? And I would say, no, but I would say, yes, it's my fault, I'm sorry. Just to get him to stop harassing me, just for him to stop, you know, having a go at me. I would just give in and tell him what he wanted to hear. Mm. But I was checked where I went to work. I had a, a tracker on my car. At work, we had CCTV. He would l remotely log in. My bank, he would have access to all the bank accounts. I would buy him food from a better shop as opposed to another shop that I had to shop with for me and my children. So he would have a different shelf for him and the children would be like, why can't we have that? Oh and I'd say, that's your dad's food. You know, it's, he can't, we can't do anything. We just have to have what we've got. You know, I had a limit. I had a budget of how much I could spend on the children. And sometimes I didn't have enough for me. So I wouldn't eat. And that was a habit from childhood. Why it doesn't really matter if I do or don't eat. But life went on and my daughter started to ask questions as to why. Why do you do this to mummy? Why do you do that? At university, I've seen so-and-so's parents pick her up. They don't do this. How old was your daughter at the time? She was then 19. Mm. Okay. When she started to really speak out. And then my other son, he got to 16, taking his GCSEs and his father hit him. And I stood up and first time I stood up to him and said, don't hit the children. You will never hurt my children. Why are you doing that? But instead of walking away with the two boys at that time, I thought I'll send my son off to boarding school. I can afford that and I'll work another few jobs. I'll open another business that will give me enough income to send him off and support him. It'll be good for him. It'll be good for him. You know, it's a good thing to do. But he then felt like he was sent away, like he'd done something wrong. There was that, uh, that sort of displacement for him that I want to be with my family. I want to protect my mother and brother, but I've been sent away. My other son became ill chronically in hospital with a autoimmune disease, which is caused by stress because it has to go somewhere. When you're feeling a certain way, you either externalize it, which is why yeah. I say to people, talk about it. Yeah. If you don't talk about it, it goes internally. It's going to affect you health-wise, mentally, it's going to affect you. And it affected him to a point where they were playing for a Premier League academy. They couldn't play anymore. He couldn't, he lost his companionship with his brother because his brother was sent away. And, you know, he was down, he was depressed. And when he came out of hospital after a really big operation, my daughter received this text message that I talk about, a picture message saying, I'm sorry. And the pictures of my son slumped on a table like this, a dining table, and I'm lying on a sofa. And she's thinking it's three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm at university. And why is he sending this picture? Because my mum doesn't sleep. She's got insomnia. She doesn't sleep because he locks her in a room at 11 o'clock. He opens the locks at 3 a.m. So she can't sleep. He set her pillow on fire so she can't sleep. So what's going on? And why is my brother like this? She thought we were dead. Wow. She said to me time and time and time, I'm going to get a call saying you're dead. I know it. I'm, I know that's going to happen. I'm never going to see you again. Leave him. Do something. And I would say, it's okay. It's all right, because it's hard. It's hard yeah. moving away from everything you've ever known. Of course I was, it is. I was living in that pain that I thought I deserved. I understand. I understand. But I never thought about the children. And I'm being honest now, and I'm being, people might think I'm harsh on myself, but this is a lesson to other parents that it affects the whole family, not just you. You think you're taking it so that you can keep the family together, so that you're giving them what they need, but it's not what they need. They need safety. They need safeguarding. And he set my pillow on fire. He could have done it to any of them. He locked my door every night. He locked my son's door too. How did you get away? 
my son spoke out. And you know, for a 15 year old to speak out, <laughs> he must have been so brave, but we were very quickly removed and you had 20 minutes to take what you needed and you panic. You know, if I was to take you to a supermarket and say, all right, Andrew, pick up what you want. You've got 20 minutes. You'll, you'll think for the first couple of minutes, what do I take? Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to take. My son's running up and down the stairs. He's got a disease that makes him go to the loo a lot. Um, so he's sat on the loo because he's panicking. Mm. The lady's saying, we have to go. Do you need these charges? Do you need this? She doesn't even know what to do. She's panicking because I didn't want him to turn up and we had a really small gap. And what was it? Like police were with you? We had social services that had given me an ultimatum, but I asked somebody to help me that was from the school because the school very much involved. Okay. The only thing about independent schools is they do take a lot of care and due diligence and they were very much involved in our safety. I had to get to the local council where the police would be there and they would be monitoring what I was doing and then I would be placed into a safe house. And we did get to the safe house and when we got to the safe house, I had a coat on, like a big long coat. My son had trainers and his Barcelona top on and that was it. Phones, chargers, no money, nothing. I thought we would be placed into a house where somebody would look after us and we'd be cared yeah. for, but we were placed in the roughest area in Lutterworth the estates that I just didn't even know existed where people are throwing bottles around outside. And as soon as we entered the room, the door, I opened the door to the flat and the carpets are sodden with urine. Oh the God. smell really got to the back of your throat. The walls are covered with human feces because whoever lived there before, I think must have been children emptying their own nappies. I don't know, but it was unfit. It was unfit for any human to live, but we did. And I wrapped him up in my coat that night and I, describe the fact that I went in the other room and I allowed myself to cry. You know, I said to myself, it's okay. I needed to cry, but I cried for my six-year-old self that should have been playing with dollies or her father should have been teaching her how to ride a bike. I cried for that 14-year-old that was passed from person to person and abused in the way she was and broken. I cried for the 21-year-old that had had hope in her heart that her family would love her. And I told myself I would either drown in those tears or dance in them. And I got up and I weirdly started to dance. There was no music. There were people on bikes outside, but I was moving. And it was almost in that movement I was releasing the pain that I felt. And I had someone who relied on me, right? I had to do the right thing for him. As a parent, you have to do the right thing. You don't get a choice if when you're a parent. You don't, yeah. get, you don't get that day off. You have to do it. You've brought that child into you. this world. You're responsible. And I just said to myself, I'll make it right for him. You know, I'll make it right. We became homeless shortly after that because you can only stay in safe accommodation for so long. And I was a millionaire on paper. I had successful businesses. I had a home worth so much money. I had buildings, but you can't just get that money straight back. You know, it's, it's invested in something. And I tried to explain this, but no, we can't help you. You can't sign on, you know, you can't get government helping or funding. So I was on my own with him. And, you know, I say to people, don't walk past a homeless person without making eye contact, without saying to them, how are you doing today? It's really cold. Can I get you anything? Do you want a hot drink? Instead of placing that hot drink and making yourself feel better, I wanted to be seen. So do they. Um, somebody took us in, a lady that I call my angel. Her name's Nikki Bliss. She's such a beautiful person. She said we could stay with her as long as we wanted. And we stayed for a month because I'm one of these people that doesn't like anyone helping her. And I worked every job until I could get enough money to rent a house because no one wanted to rent to me. And then I got to 50. I moved 200 miles away from where I originally lived. I was still being hunted by my ex-partner, by my dad. My oh brothers my had God. found out that I was now out there and they could get me. And I had this realization, you know, that both my sons suffered from mental health now because of what they'd seen, the abuse, which is their story, really. Yeah. But I realized that I got to choose who I was going to be. And I was grounding because I do this thing where I stand on the grass and I say my affirmations, which you can say them and they mean nothing, or you can say them and they mean everything. And I rewrote my own belief system. You know, I was now this tall person, not a small person. And I think they called me small because they were trying to shrink me as a person. 
I said to myself, I am beautiful because I've never done anything wrong to anyone. And even aesthetically from the outside, if I wasn't what someone described as beautiful, I was beautiful for me, which matters because you come first. And that's not being selfish, that's actually being, you know, self-care and as loving yourself. And I decided that I wouldn't let anybody feel the way I ever felt. I didn't know what I had to do, but I knew I had to do something. I had to raise the awareness of honour killings. I had to raise the awareness that gender-based violence is a thing where children are married at young ages, sexually abused and treated so badly because they're born a girl. Yeah. I found out that I had a half-sister when I was homeless, but I couldn't acknowledge it in my head because I was going through so much myself. I sort of put it away, maybe in that box again. And I started to think about her and the fact that she was abducted. Um, my father had an extramarital affair. He had a daughter with a Polish lady and he got the mother of the, their daughter drunk and abducted the daughter. Uh. And he took this six-year-old girl who I just recently found out, is, her name is Julia. He took this girl who was my half-sister by force and uh, he sold her to human traffickers in India where they harvest organs. And I found all of this out because the police came looking for me to ask me if they could have a character reference. And I felt bad. Sorry that I didn't press charges. I didn't fight enough because I was too scared. There's nothing you could have done. But I knew that I might never see her again, but I knew there was other girls out there that are being taken out of the country like she was. And something in me was very much adamant that I had to do something about it. So I said I would do 100 podcasts, so I would get 100 messages out to different audiences, and maybe there would be somebody working at airport security that would listen out. Maybe there would be a teacher that would speak out when a girl was going missing or the girl saying, I'm going to India and ask more questions. I thought maybe there would be a policeman that would maybe understand more about this culture that I've been brought up in. And I want to take away the word honour killing from any legal document so that they are charged for murder yeah. or attempted murder. 100%. 100%. There's no doubt that the work you've been doing has it's saved lives. So many people have now heard, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions have now heard your story. And as you say, if just one or two of those people were found themselves in situations where they were able to help, I'm sure they now will have done. So in that sense, you've saved lives. It's not really about what I've done. It's just what I'm hoping others can do. You know, yeah. I'm not I can't do everything on my own. I've, in my TED talk, I say stand with me because it's never been about me. It's about those people, like I said earlier, living my old life. You know, if I'd had someone maybe campaigning the way I do, maybe somebody would have heard more and my French teacher might have asked me what's wrong instead of telling me to stop crying and telling me to leave the room, stand outside. Maybe in the bullying that I endured, the teachers would have listened. And I have a lot of health officials now contacting me you know, one of my videos, as I told you before, went viral. It went to 25 million in three weeks. And I ended up with 15, now 15,000 messages from victims, just the victim messages saying, help me. They always start with, I need your help or help me. Oh my God. And I have to answer them because that was once me. Yeah. You ask for help one time. If someone doesn't reply, you think I don't deserve it. You're going to run yourself into the ground though. I, I'm going to create a system that works better, but I don't want anyone to ever feel what I did. And if you've been there, you would understand. And I, I, yeah, I know what you're saying. I, I, it's <clears throat> something that drives me mad. And it's something that I spoke to somebody called Yasmin Mohammed about, and it's a different culture. This was from Islam. And she said that, why is it that people get so upset when it's a white girl that something <clears throat> happens to, or a white boy, and not when it, in her case, when it's a Muslim child or a Muslim girl, because people are so worried about offending. Oh, and yeah. That's, I mean, that's got to stop. Comments have been, I've done a lot of interviews and a lot of the comments are, is she Muslim? She must be Muslim. It doesn't matter it's if I'm Muslim yeah. because 
this is an honor killing this is a forced arranged marriage i'm talking about not a religion oh why don't she go back to her own country these people shouldn't have been allowed to come to this country they sh these foreigners should go back oh, but they're they're not understanding the problem still there even if this is happening in a different country you've got to be talking about the problem that i'm bringing forward child marriages happen in 44 states in america i keep <laughs> going back to america to talk about 12 year olds marrying men that are in their 40s yeah. Let's talk about that. Then, well, then people care, don't they? Because they, then suddenly when you tell them that, oh, and they want to look into it. They like, don't know about it. They well, say they don't, they don't know about, know about, it, about yeah. it. Maybe they don't. But, but for me, an injustice against whether you're a man or a woman or a child is wrong. Any yeah. injustice, I stand for that. Regardless of culture not, or belief. I'm not criticizing India or Indians or Punjabis or Muslims or Sikhs or Hindus or Christians. I'm not. I'm criticizing and calling out the people that cause harm, the ones that are performing these horrible acts. It's a, it's a beautiful message. And how can people follow and help? So I'm, I've got a non-profit called End Honor Killings. You know, when people say, think of a non-profit name, I just said it as it was. It doesn't just cover that one subject. I have a lot of people saying, can I get help? I'm not from your culture. I've not had an attempt at honor killing. Of course you can. Um, so people can help by asking questions. You know, not to be so consumed by what might be said or what might not what might not be said. To be kind. I still remember that one woman when I was fifteen who was kind. Kindness is underestimated. It's huge. It's a power to be kind. And if you are struggling yourself, to be brave. Brave enough to know that you deserve more than you've got right now. You deserve it. Yeah. And you're important. You do matter. Because <laughs> a lot of people think they don't matter and they really, really do. Be brave, be courageous, and be a heretic. Um, go and follow. We'll put some links below that will help this cause uh, from Nina's organizations and, and your Twitter and things, I think, we'll put below so you can follow and find out more. Please keep on watching this channel. I'll put something similar here for you to watch. So just click here and keep watching.